Hello, Queerlings. Happy Wednesday. Before we get into today's topic, I wanted to spend a few moments to tell you about, surprise, our sponsor for this episode. This episode is being sponsored by Hank Green and his new book, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor. Hank's first book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, was released in 2018, the story of a young woman thrown into and then growing her fame as the world suddenly has to deal with massive changes in the form of contagious dreams and mysterious 10-foot-tall robots that have appeared in every major city. Well, now that novel is out in paperback, or at your library, and also for cheap in audio form, and the sequel and conclusion of the story, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, is out to sparkling reviews. The reason why you're hearing about this book on this podcast is because Hank wanted his publisher to sponsor a ton of small podcasts, but they said that that was too weird, so instead Hank took 5% of his advance from the book and did it himself because he loves podcasts and we love Hank. Library Journal's starred review said, quote, Throughout this adventurous, witty, and compelling novel, Green delivers sharp social commentary on the power of social media and both the benefits and horrendous consequences that follow when we give too much of ourselves to technology. I think that sounds really rad. The book came out on July 7th in physical audio and ebook form wherever books are sold, and you can also go to hankgreen.com and that'll get you where you need to go. I hope you go out and read it. I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to History is Gay, a podcast that examines the underappreciated and overlooked queer ladies, gents, and gentle envies that have always been there in the unexplored corners of history. Because history has never been as straight as you think. Welcome back. History is Gay is back. Thank you for giving us a uh, a month of break, and I really hope that you took the opportunity to check out some of the podcasts that we recommended and listen to some really wonderful voices. Uh, today, I, Lee, hello, I'm Lee. I didn't even announce myself. I have a wonderful guest host joining me on this episode. They are a friend of the pod and also was one of our first uh, highest tier patrons from way back. And I love them dearly. Hi, Marin. How are you? Welcome. Hi, Lee. I am great. It is very early for both of us. Yes. (laughs) Our schedules have finally sort of kind of aligned to do this episode after like a year. <laughs> what was it, um, March of last year we started trying this? <laughs> something like that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Marin, tell uh, tell the listeners, folks who are our, our lovely community, a little bit about yourself, and then we'll launch a little bit into what we're going to talk about today. Ah, uh, yes, this thing that I knew was coming and definitely have something prepared for. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I mean, you know, you're a cool person who uh, runs yeah, a lot I, of, like, role-playing games. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm Marin. I'm a writer, uh, not published yet, so you can't find any of my work anywhere. I usually spend my days uh, as a walking cliche, being a white queer who works at Starbucks and dreams of making it big. Um, <laughs> we all gotta start somewhere. <laughs> Um, uh, my training, uh, professionally is in, uh, linguistics and anthropology, which is only vaguely going to be relevant for this episode. Marin will say the German things. All one of the German words? What? Yeah, all one of the German words. Um, <laughs> they pronounced it before we started hitting recording, and I'm like, okay, cool, you're gonna do that one. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, today we're going to talk about Alan Turing, who is the uh, the father of modern computing, the person who uh, put basically artificial intelligence on the map and saved the allies from the Nazis with his awesome code breaking abilities, or uh, as I like to call him, and I'm guilty of the of creating the name of this episode, Alan Turing, Computer Daddy because I'm trash. Um, So yeah, we're going to talk about Alan Turing. He is somebody that we've wanted to talk about for quite some time. 
content warnings. There's going to be discussion of suicide. There's going to be mention of war and government repression of homosexuality. If you are familiar at all with the story of Alan Turing, you'll know that it is one where homophobia reigns supreme. This is going to be obviously a people-focused episode, so we'll go into a little bit of context and then a bio, and as always, we will end the podcast with how gay were they, our personal ranking, and how likely it is that they weren't straight. Uh, a couple of announcements. I'm currently in the process of trying to find a new co-host, as you might have seen on Twitter, and I had announced in our last full episode. People have sent some really wonderful things, and I am talking with a whole bunch of folks. Uh, I'm really excited for what will come in the future. I have, I have met and talked with some really fantastic folks, and I'm excited for the future of this show, um, kind of wherever it takes us. But for a while, it may be wonderful friends like Marin who come onto the show and do beautiful guest hosting. So with that, Marin, are you are you ready? Are you ready to dive into the life of computer daddy? I'm, God, just, I'm not going to stop. I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm, I said it again. I'm not going to stop saying it. I'm so proud of this. I'm as proud of this as I am as when Gretchen and I came up with May I Hold Your Hand in episode oh. three. Okay. <laughs> Uh, for, for those without the benefit of being able to see my face, which unfortunately due to the lighting situation also includes Lee, the first time they said it, I had the biggest grimace on my face. <laughs> I'm just going to continue to torment Marin throughout this entire episode. It's going to be great, y'all. Yeah, no, Marin uh, is recording in their closet, so there's, like, no overhead light, and it looks like they've been blocked out by, like, a, like a you know, TV studio, like, news reporting, some salacious story that they don't want to be identified by. So, I mean, as, like, a non-binary person, that's a big, big mood. It's like, yeah, like, don't, don't address me, don't acknowledge me, don't see anything about me that you could comment on. Thanks. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's enviable. Um, is it, is it, would you say it's enviable? Oh, oh, there we go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Marin's the new coast. Marin's the new coast, everyone. They, they get the puns. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to get started because we have a short amount of time because I'm the asshole who made Marin get up and do this episode before they had to go to work as a barista. So let's start off and talk a little bit about some general historical context of the time. Uh, we don't have a huge amount, but we wanted to give just a couple of little bits, and Marin will start us off just talking a little bit about what uh, English public school was like at the time that Alan Turing was in it, because it's got some interesting uh, quirks. That's certainly a way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, in England in the mid-20th century, which is, you know, when Alan Turing was growing up, there was this concept that public school was supposed to be sort of a mini version of England. They called it the nation in miniature, and basically the younger students were supposed to emulate the lower classes. They would do all of the chores, they would serve the older boys in a very literal sense, and the older students would emulate the upper class. They would mete out punishments for those who stepped out of line, and they also generally had a lot of more free time and ability to pursue their various interests as opposed to the younger boys who had to spend a lot of their time basically cleaning up after the older boys. <laughs> Gotta love just a good old-fashioned caste system in your education. Wow. Nothing like indoctrination from an early age to get people on board with the social system. Woo! There was also, interestingly enough, an expectation that they would actually start exploring their sexuality with one another, but not that much and not openly, because this is Britain and nothing involving emotions can be... <laughs> <laughs> open. And then, of course, they would graduate, big old air quotes there, uh, from their explorations with each other to being not gay. <laughs> yeah. As we've seen in many instances of like societally expected or open to kind of homosexual or bisexual behavior in youth and then the expectations of marriage. In terms of the actual legal atmosphere, so legally and socially 
homophobia was ingrained. The law at the time, which we have talked about a little bit before on this show, was section 11 of the criminal code in the UK, which is the same law that Oscar Wilde was convicted under, the law against gross indecency, which is actually what Turing would eventually be convicted under. So at this time, this law is on the books. And even though this was the legal recourse, the main tool of oppression against homosexuality was just simply making it something that you don't talk about. It wasn't something that was discussed in polite company or really any company at all, and its lack of discussion would, to an ordinary person, make it clearly taboo. And as we will talk about, Alan Turing was probably the farthest from ordinary in terms of observing social cues and social mores and so, or social mores. I can't say that without thinking of like more eels because I'm a nerd. <laughs> but yeah, we'll talk more about that. And because I'm a words gay, I don't understand any of the mathematics that we're going to talk about in this entire episode. I'm going to let Marin talk about like what was going on in uh, mathematics and computing at the time that Turing came in and was a superstar. Yeah, uh, so there was definitely a version of this outline that had a lot more detail here, uh, but we <laughs> cut it down because it's very boring. <laughs> Um, so during this time, the word computer did not mean a device that computes things, unless you count a person as a device, which most people didn't. It was a word for an occupation. There were people who computed for companies, for uh, organizations, for governments. So a computer was someone who just sat at a desk and did math all day. And the mathematical side of things was and generally is still seen as an exercise in logic, devoid of any sort of real life implications. Theory was the name of the mathematical game and practical solutions to theoretical problems were practically unheard of. Whoa. I'm on a roll. Oh, yeah. We're just getting started. We're like 15 minutes in. Um, so let's dive into who Alan Turing was. Let's talk a little bit about him, uh, and let's dive into a bio. All right. Alan Turing was born Alan Matheson Turing on June 23rd, 1912, in the Paddington District of London in England, to a father that was in the Indian Civil Service, and he was raised along with his brother, primarily by his mother, whose name was Ethel Turing. Growing up, his father spent much time in India, and his mother basically bounced between home and India with Alan's father. So when Ethel was away, the boys were sent off to live with a family member. Following World War I, Alan's mother kind of stayed with the boys and continued to raise them pretty solely. She was uh, said to have been fond of church going, although Alan was distinctly not, calling her favorite house of worship, quote, the church with the bad smells. So you'll see uh, early on, he was, a, he was a cheeky little shit uh, and just continued to- It never dialed down. Not no, once. he never dialed down. He re he read everyone. It was great. Um, he frequently tested the limits of any authority around him, or as biographer Andrew Hodges put it, which we'll be referencing him a lot because he's like one of the main scholars and the very large, very dense biography of Alan Turing was written by him. It's called Alan Turing, The Enigma. He puts it, he was, quote, slow to learn that indistinct line that separated initiative from disobedience. Which is it's a kind way to put, uh, he was a cheeky little shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so his, his mother would say to him, you'll be a good boy, won't you? To which Alan replied, yes, but sometimes I'll forget. Which, uh, fair. I think we all forget to be a good person every so often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He exhibited signs of his genius and his interest in mathematics and logic from an early age, but he struggled with subjects he wasn't as interested in, which is a big mood. And a true Gavin Claw, if you ask me. Um, fuck JKR, but that belongs yes. to us. That belongs to the transes. Uh, but yeah, like somebody who's like, mm, you want me to do and learn this thing, but I'm going to go over here and do this thing that is way more interesting. His work was frequently chided as sloppy, distracted, and turned in a literal mess. It was usually covered in ink splotches from his pen. Uh, he also had extremely ha messy handwriting, which his teachers often commented on. He initially had some trouble with reading, but, you know, like we said, as soon as he found something that he was super interested in, he dove all in. He taught himself to read in about three weeks from a book called Reading Without Tears. He was quicker, in general, to recognize figures and numbers, and he did things like 
stop at lampposts to read and identify the serial number. He really liked recipes and formula. Once the rules of something were agreed upon, his kind of follow through with that is that they must be followed without bending or cheating because there are rules in place and this is how we do it. But if he didn't see the logic or the sense of the rules, he disregarded them. If something didn't make sense to him, why follow it? At the age of nine, his headmistress from St. Michael's Primary School in Hastings reported, quote, I have had clever boys and hardworking boys, but Alan is a genius. So we're dealing with like a very tiny, messy genius from the get-go. And one time when he was on vacation with his family, he noticed that there were a bunch of bees in the yard and decided that he wanted to get some honey for his family. So like any normal person, uh, Alan Turing walks into the backyard charts the path of the bees, <laughs> finds the hive, harvests the honey, and comes back with it. I love him. Which is wild. A child did that. <laughs> That's like some Christopher Robin Pooh Bear shit right there. And I love it. <laughs> um, and very, uh, very young, he was given um, a book called Natural Wonders Every Child Should Know by Edwin Tenney Brewster as a birthday gift from his mother. The book instilled with him an absolute fascination for science. It explained that things had to have a reason for why they were the way they were, and that that reason did not come from God, as many people, especially teachers of young children, would say, but from science. Uh, the book also describes living things and bodies as machines, which many people, biographer Hodges included, really think influenced his interest in artificial intelligence later in life. For all of the body is a machine, why not the mind? Turing eventually got old enough to go to school and was first placed into Hazelhurst Preparatory School in the year 1922, where he became interested in chess, spending long hours working out complex chess problems on his own, but uh, he didn't really like the authorities in place. <laughs> Uh, they deprived him of his usual distractions. He felt extremely stifled and wasn't able to focus on any of his actual interests. But there's a ray of, of sunshine here. Uh, at the age of 16 in 1926, he was enrolled in the English public school of Sherborne. It's a very old public school in England. And it's there that he started to finally come into his own, started to thrive in his subject's special interest. On these... <laughs> This, this is, is fantastic. fantastic. The day he was supposed to start travel to Sherburne to start school, the 1906, 196, yes, good job, Marin. Uh, the 1926 <laughs> uh, general strike began and all public transport was shut down. This place was 60 miles from his home. He's a 16 year old boy and he decides, I'm gonna bike there gonna to make it for the nice first day. Bike ride. It's gonna take a nice 60 mile bike ride. It's fine. So never let anyone tell you that you cannot be both a nerd and a jock, because Alan Turing was both. <laughs> oh, flying colors. <laughs> uh, he rode his bicycle for 60 miles over two days, sent a parcel of clothes ahead of him, used the money his father was going to give him for a train ticket to pay for food and lodging at a tavern along the way. And then when he got to school, he sent his dad back the leftover money. <laughs> Of course. I mean, the money was meant to be used for the trip and nothing else, so I gotta send it back to dad, right? Obviously. He also, I think he also arrived before his clothes. Yes, he did. Because yes, he, he had, sent he spent them, a, he, he sent them like... I think they were sent on the train. Yeah. <laughs> and the train, being public transit, didn't go anywhere for a week. Exactly. So, he, so I think, I think they, like, I think they arrived like a full months. week after he arrived there. So it was like first week of school, he was just wearing the same clothes that he biked 60 miles in. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love it. Like there's gonna be so many of these little anecdotes that we're just like, um, what a badass. So at, at Sherburn School, Alan met a fellow student who was a year older than him and a year ahead of him in school. His name was Christopher Morecambe and he would become his greatest friend and one of the most significant relationships in Turing's life. They shared an interest in science and math and they talked about chemistry astronomy, they consistently wrote to one another and spent their school breaks together. Chris basically helped draw Turing out of his shell and make other friends, and it's worth noting that without meeting Christopher, Turing would likely never have developed even the few social graces that he did gain. He never would have seen the point of them, and Morcom was there to basically say, like, hey, you're really great, but also, like, maybe say please and thank you sometimes. We're gonna talk about Morcom a lot more, later, 
But uh, we'll move on to college. Fun times in college. Uh, Alan won a scholarship to King's College, Cambridge, and enrolled in 1931 to study what else but mathematics. At Cambridge, he was notable for succeeding, like Marin said, in both academic and athletic pursuits. So a nerd and a jock. In addition to his mathematics work, he was a cross-country runner, and actually later in his life would actually make a bid for the Olympics and qualified for it, but suffered a hip injury and was not able to compete and also was on the rowing team. And this is kind of where Alan finally started to make some more friends other than the one (laughs) Christopher Morkum from high school, essentially. Uh, I really loved this quote from one of Turing's contemporaries at Cambridge, Noel Annan. Uh, He spoke of Alan Turing as, quote, He was a cross-country runner of international stature and enjoyed games and treasure hunts and silliness. He poked fun at conventional people, enjoyed teasing the humanists by arguing that thought was made up of inputs and outputs and of storage capacity. If a machine could solve problems, could it not also think? Could it not write a sonnet? This, by the way, decades before he actually wrote a paper about it. (laughs) Yeah, he just was out there talking about his ideas constantly. Speaking about talking of his ideas, let's talk about (laughs) Turing as a professor. After graduating in 1934, he earned a fellowship at Cambridge at the age of 22 for his work on probability theory. A baby. So young. That is, he he earned a PhD in like four years, essentially. (laughs) And he's 22 and he's like, all right, let me, let me elaborate on frickin' Albert Einstein's probability theory. (laughs) Because that's just something you do. Oh, yeah. So during his time teaching and studying at Cambridge, that's really where he began to formalize the concept of what would come to be called a Turing machine. In particular, he was struck by the concept of the Entscheidungsproblem, or the stopping problem, uh, which was form- a problem formulated by German mathematician David Hilbert, hence the German word. And it's the question basically of whether or not there are any mathematical problems that exist that cannot be solved by an algorithm. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but to avoid boring you to sleep any further, (laughs) uh, Turing's paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem, his first major publication, he proved that no system could exist which could assess the validity of any possible mathematical statement. And he did this through proof by machine, specifically what he called a universal machine. Turing proposed a machine that could be made to do the work of any other machine. And since algorithms are by definition mechanical, therefore perform any possible algorithmic operation. The machine that he envisioned was a physical machine, and it was comprised of three components, a reader, a tape, and an instruction table. The reader at any point in time could, one, read the value written on the tape, two, move one space to the left or right on the tape, or three, write a new value onto the tape. The instruction table would tell the reader what to do at any given position based on what it read on the tape. By encoding multiple instruction tables and giving it a sort of meta instruction table telling the machine which of those tables to use and assuming an infinite tape, this machine could theoretically perform any mechanical function. And as I stated before, that means it could perform any algorithmic function. Turing proceeded to prove that there were mathematical problems that such a device could not solve thereby solving the Entscheidung's problem in the negative. It was in the early reviews of this paper that the phrase Turing machine was first used. Notably, everything named after Turing, someone else named it after him. Yeah, every single time somebody was like, blah, 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 the Turing machine. He's like, you mean the universal machine? Um, He was very much like, no, I don't want it to be named after me. It's this thing. So I I understand that this might seem like a lot of detail to provide about something that's not about how Turing was queer, but trust me, this is the barest bones of how computers work. <laughs> every mathematician listening to this is like, why didn't you go into ev- everything? And look, I, I tried so hard to follow some of these things, but I'm just not a math gay. Uh, suffice to say, like, it was absolutely groundbreaking. Right. And this was really Turing in a nutshell. What he did is he took a mathematical and, to most people, purely theoretical problem and proposed and provided a mechanical, real-world-ish solution. To him, there was no difference between the logic of the world of theory and the real world. They were one and the same. His paper was recommended for publication by Alonzo Church, uh, an American logician who had actually just a little bit before published a paper reaching the same conclusion using the pure theoretical means of math of the day. Yeah, so 
They came to the same conclusion using different methods, and Turing's eventually was the one that had profound significance for the future of computing. So October 1936, Turing moves from Cambridge to Princeton to study for a PhD in logic under Church's direction. And at this time, like, Princeton was where he got to see all of the superstars of the mathematics world. He was surrounded by other prominent mathematicians such as Richard Courant, John von Neumann, Hermann Weil, and Albert Einstein, alongside Alonzo Church. While he was there, he actually made friends with von Neumann and ended up becoming his assistant as well. He graduated from Princeton in 1938 and moved back to Cambridge where his career as a code breaker during World War II began. And this is really where we see the bulk of what Alan Turing started to bring to the computing world. So 1939, Turing was seconded from Cambridge to Bletchley Park in rural England, which was at the time the center of British efforts to break German codes during the war. So this was the HQ. While working for Britain's Code and Cipher School, Turing invented the device that cracked the, quote, Enigma, which was Germany's military code that had been the the main problem facing British intelligence. It was at the time, believed unsolvable, everybody was putting full efforts into trying to figure this thing out and get ahead of the Germans. Enter Alan Turing. The Enigma machine was a tool for encoding messages, but was relatively uncrackable on its own. The Germans had since adjusted it with a number of improvements to increase its security. We won't go into details, they're very boring and very tense, but it was basically something that was kind of consistently moving and the allies were not able to keep up with it. At the time, the use of machines to crack codes was not uncommon, especially when the code itself was machine created, but without knowing the starting values and given the relatively slow speed of machinery at the time, and machine when we say machinery, we mean big honking pieces of machinery and people physically like punching cards into them. Yeah, they were so loud that they were called bombs. Yes. Yeah, B O M B E S and it was so uh hot in the rooms that many of the women who were operating these bombs who, you know, because women were doing menial labor and not allowed to actually do the math, there were like rumors about them frequently working in like only their bras. <laughs> And Alan Turing, being, you know, a gay boy, was like, whatever. Um, Because of not knowing these starting values and the slow speed of the machinery, deciphering was considerably more difficult than actually enciphering codes, unless you had the specific key. Turing's work was focused on the slightly more paranoid naval German officers who were just that little extra bit more careful than their land force counterparts, which uh, required the ingenuity of... uh, Bletchley's best thinkers, not just the machines they were designing and using. So he was basically put on like the task force that was like, we can't figure this out. Please help. Uh, So by applying his work on computable numbers and getting a series of increasingly lucky breaks from an overconfident bordering on arrogant Nazi command, Turing and team were able to effectively decode Enigma. And through a honestly hilarious disinformation campaign, British intelligence was able to keep that fact completely hidden from the Germans, who spent the entire time thinking there was a leak in their (laughs) command providing information to the Brits. And so, even as a precaution, never improve their cryptography. I want you to hear me out on this. Maybe a belief that you're inherently better than other people makes you (gasps) overconfident and prone to error. No! Yeah, I know, right? Wild! What's what's hubris? (laughs) Uh, so cracking this code gave British and Allied forces the advantage and advanced knowledge of German maneuvers, which they were then able to exploit to save lives. Most notably, this helped save supply convoys coming across the Atlantic from U-boat interdiction, allowing a besieged Britain to hold out against German attacks. A lot of people, especially historians from the 20th century, uh, will try to attribute victory in the land war to the decoding of Enigma, but they usually give more credit than is actually due to German leadership, who often made just catastrophic errors of judgment due to an inability to maintain their supply lines. Literally, Germany just kept advancing too fast. <laughs> ah, the old Napoleon problem. The old Napoleon problem. <laughs> Um, so decoding their, their movements, while useful, was way, way, way less critical and often far less timely than for their naval counterparts. And this is all of that analysis there was mostly courtesy of Hodges and his biography as well. 
if you've seen the uh, movie, the 2014 movie with Benedict Cumberbatch, The Imitation Game, you might be of the opinion or might be have been led to believe that Turing was like an underdog fighting for the use of the computer and the machine to be used. But that's not really the case. Everyone was on board for mechanized decryption. Turing just was the best at it. <laughs> <laughs> He received an OBE, an Order of the British Empire, in 1946 for his role in, co- in uh, breaking the, co- the Enigma Code, which is one of the highest awards of chivalry in the UK. It- uh, also at Bletchley Park, he had a brief engagement to a woman named Joan Clark. They were, you know, really good friends, and so the two got engaged. But soon after, Turing was like, I'm too gay for this. I can't do this. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about this more, but... Um, <laughs> what I love about Joan Clark is she's like, okay, that's fine. We could still be married. Um, uh, so, like, you know, even in the mid to late 20th century, marriage was seen as a social obligation. Uh, Turing was even convincing enough to impress Clark's parents, but the engagement was eventually called off regardless, which we'll talk about more. But that was a significant friendship and more that had happened while he was at Bletchley Park. Some of my favorite <laughs> fun, quirky Alan things while he was at Bletchley Park because this is he where he really so got... much ridiculous shit. <laughs> he gained he gained a reputation for being an eccentric. It really ramped up at Bletchley Park. So he was called Prof, so short for Professor, by his colleagues, and his entire treatise on the Enigma was just known as Prof's book. One of Alan's colleagues, Jack Good, described some of Alan's quirks and eccentricities, saying, "In the first week of June each year, he would get a bad attack of hay fever." And and he would cycle to the office wearing a service gas mask to keep the pollen off. The bicycle had a fault. The chain would come off at regular intervals. Instead of having it mended, he would count the number of times the pedals went round and would get off the bicycle in time to adjust the chain by hand. Another of his eccentricities is that he chained his mug to the radiator pipes to prevent it being stolen. So all of these things, like, instead of getting my bike fixed, I'm just gonna mathematically figure out when I need to get off, interrupt what I'm doing, and put the chain back on. And also, I just really love the image of, like, him running around Bletchley Park with, like, literally a mug chained to his person. Be like, please don't take my favorite mug. I'm imagining the mug just has prof written on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or, like, best, like, number one prof. <laughs> Prof's the best. I love it. This this next one is, is my absolute favorite Turing story. So um, in Britain, they don't have the National Guard, they have the Home Guard. And Turing being a pretty classic, uh, in some ways, uh, British dude, was like, hmm, this war nonsense, I don't really understand it, but I would really like to become a crack shot with a rifle. <laughs> so he boys. enrolled in the Home Guard. <laughs> Uh, And to do this, as with any good bureaucracy, you have to fill out a form. And the form asks the question, do you understand that by enrolling in the Home Guard, you are under military law? He looked at this, verbally said, well, I don't see any conceivable advantage in answering yes, marked no, and was enrolled anyway because no one actually checked the (laughs) questions, only that it had been signed. Lesson, read the form. (laughs) So... He went to training, became a crack shot with a rifle, because this is Alan Turing and there's nothing he can't do, and then just stopped doing the things that you're supposed to do as a member of the Home Guard. He stopped going to parades and was eventually called in for questioning. When asked about his repeated absences, he simply responded that he was a good shot and no longer needed the Home Guard. I'm done now. The examiner responds that it's his duty as a soldier to go on parade when called, and Turing responds... I'm not a soldier. To which the examiner says, What do you mean you're not a soldier? You're under military law. And Turing goes, Well, I rather thought this situation might come up, and I have protected myself. Which is the cheekiest (laughs) thing to say to the guy court-martialing you. (laughs) This guy had no fear. None at all. He asked the examiner to get the form, and lo and behold, he'd answered no to the question, had been improperly enrolled, and the only thing for the establishment to do was declare him not a member, which was what Turing wanted. <laughs> like, that right, is cool. some Lex Luthor bullshit. <laughs> that is, that is, you know what that is? That is some chess player bullshit. That is him looking two moves ahead, being like, hmm, all right, I know it's going to come out of this, so I'm going to protect myself. This is also where he f- it's kind of starts his first glimpses in thinking about and developing his ideas around thinking machines. Following the war, Allen continued his work and took a position at the National Physical Laboratory in 1945. And while at NPL, he created plans for what was 
going to be called the Automatic Computing Machine. This was abbreviated as ACE, and he created the, the first complete set of designs for what this was, which was a stored program, all digital computer. Had Turing's ACE actually been built, it would have been an incredible leap forward for computing and early memory. His colleagues, when presented with this, this design, were like, this is way too complicated and difficult to engineer, and basically stymied him from actually building it. This was another example of Turing living in reality and being like, hey, let's make this actual physical thing, and everybody else was kind of stuck in the theoretical realm. So as he had experienced before, he was continually thwarted by bureaucracy and by perceptions around his lack of social graces. So out of frustration at not being able to actually construct his design, he resigned from NPL and returned to Cambridge, where he was recruited by Max Newman for a teaching position at University of Manchester in 1948. And there he became the deputy director of the Computing Machine Laboratory. And not necessarily by by any, you know, like, ah, yes, he worked up to become the dire deputy director. There was no directorship at the time. So it was like, yeah, sure, here's where we'll put you. And he he brought his ideas of the Turing machine or, or universal machine to the project, and he worked on software for what would become one of the earliest stored program computers, which would eventually come to be known as the Manchester Mark I. He wrote the original programming manual, and his system was used in the Ferranti Mark I, which was the first marketable electronic digital computer. So the first one that people could actually buy in 1951. During his time in Manchester, he also dove deeper into the abstract work and mathematics that he was kind of just always working on and continued developing his ideas on thinking machines, which we generally know as artificial intelligence. He referred to his work and the development of digital computers as the construction of an electronic brain. And so the natural conclusion of this, the natural uh, evolution, was the question of, well, if I'm making an electronic brain, can it actually think and behave like a biological one? And he was, as we mentioned earlier, a proponent of the idea that the human brain was basically a digital computer anyway. And he published a highly influential paper in 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which discussed the possibilities and implications of intelligence in machinery. The paper began, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And then promptly he said it was the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he developed uh, something else, which he called the Imitation Game, which is the name of both a movie and a graphic novel that are completely separate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> about Alan Turing's life. Um, which uh, we all know now as the Turing Test. It's a method for seeing if something is intelligent, or at least close enough. Uh, the idea is to suggest that if a human person can't tell the computer and another human apart with a reliability better than chance, it seems fair to the computer to just <laughs> say that it's intelligent. <laughs> There you go. Um, and there's there's a, a version of this, an older version of this, um, for chess. Uh, and he, Turing wrote, uh, It is not difficult to devise a paper machine which will play a not very bad game of chess. Now get three men as subjects for the experiment, A, B, and C. A and C are to be rather poor chess players, and B is the operator who works the paper machine. Two rooms are used with the same arrangement for communicating moves, and the game is played between C and either A or the paper machine, B. C may find it quite difficult to tell which he is playing. And uh, these days, uh, the Turing test is typically used in reverse, by which I mean capture technology. Yay! Anytime you're asked if you're a robot, it's a robot trying to tell if you're a robot or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really interesting that, like, we can just, even things you don't really think about a lot, like, we just see the implications and the impact of Turing's work everywhere. So, March 1951, Turing was kind of at the height of his career. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and just when he had reached this pinnacle, it would all come crashing down amid homophobia rearing its ugly head. So... Alan had never, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but Alan had never really been particularly interested in keeping his sexuality close to his chest. It had been somewhat of an open secret at Bletchley in Cambridge, but at this time he would become a scapegoat for British homophobia under the Labochere Amendment. So around Christmas 1951, Turing met a 19-year-old working class man named Arnold Murray, and they struck up a brief affair. And after a few rendezvous, Turing gifted him a penknife, uh, which, being an unemployed man, he probably just would have wanted money. And the next time they got together, Alan found some money, like, 
eight or ten pounds missing from his wallet that was taken by Murray. A month later, a friend of Arnold Murray's burglarized Allen's apartment. Uh, it was most likely let's be real, a setup between the two of them. Turing reported the burglary to the police, and uh, in the course of the investigation, Alan admitted that he and Murray had had sex together. And police being police, uh, you know, all cats are beautiful. Um, <laughs> Alan, Alan had said, like, what's going to happen about all this? Isn't there a royal commission sitting to legalize it? So thinking, you know, why be afraid of telling them what had transpired between the two of us? It's going to become legal anyway. Homosexuality actually wouldn't become legal in the UK until 1967. So freaking cops being cops and not doing their job arrested Alan for gross indecency instead of, like, I don't know, investigating a burglary at your house. So... By February of 1952, he was arrested on 12 charges of gross indecency, just like Oscar Wilde 27 years before him. And I think that's really important to contextualize that this is, this is you know, the world of Oscar Wilde and the world of Alan Turing are Not 27, as far away as you might think. <laughs> 27 years apart. So if you think like Oscar Wilde getting in prison for homosexuality is like old world kind of stuff. This is less than a 30 year old span. Uh, so he and Murray were among over 2000 men Britain had brought similar charges against in, in like that year. Turing and Murray went on trial in March 1952. And unfortunately, the classified nature of Turing's contributions to the war effort prevented the few of Turing's colleagues who actually came to defend him from being able to mention them on his behalf at the trial. They weren't actually able to say exactly what he was doing at Bletchley and how much his work helped the war efforts because they were all under major secrecy. It was a top secret program. They were not allowed to talk about it. And so when they were in investigated in the trial, they were just like, all they could say was like, we worked together and he was really great. So the court faced with little character witness basically showed no mercy. Alan and Murray pled guilty and were convicted of the charges, and Alan had no interest in denying the charges. He didn't argue or provide any evidence against the allegations. He was, you know, quote-unquote guilty after all. He was given the option of either a one-year prison sentence or to be placed on probation under the condition that he undergo, quote-unquote, organotherapy, which was at the time basically known as chemical castration. Since Alan was had already been convicted of a crime, he was stripped of his security clearance and barred from ever working in code breaking for the government again. So he knew that that wasn't going to be a possibility. But he wanted to continue his work in artificial intelligence and being able to, you know, even access a computer. So in order to continue his work the best he could, he chose the chemical castration. The punishment would involve forcible estrogen injections over the course of a year intended to curb his libido and quote-unquote cure his homosexuality. Oh. As we all know, this is bullshit. Um, Alan took the punishment um, pretty well. He expected to return to normal after the treatment, and he wrote in a letter to his friend Norman Routledge during the trial, I've got myself into the kind of trouble that I have always considered to be quite a possibility for me, though I have usually rated it at about a 10 to 1 against. I shall shortly be pleading guilty to a charge of sexual offenses with a young man. The story of how it all came to be found out is a long and fascinating one, which I shall have to make into a short story one day, but haven't the time to tell you now. No doubt I shall emerge from it all a different man, but quite who I have not found out. Glad you enjoyed broadcast. Jefferson certainly was rather disappointing, though. I am afraid that the following syllogism may be used by some in the future. Turing believes machines think. Turing lies with men. Therefore, machines do not think. Yours in distress, Alan. He had also written to his friend Philip Hall after the sentencing came down, quote, I am both bound over for a year and obliged to take this organotherapy for the same period. It is supposed to reduce sexual urge whilst it goes on. The psychiatrist seems to think it useless to try and do any psychotherapy. So he had gone into this process with the idea that he would, you know, return to quote-unquote normal. Um, 
but it took its toll. Uh, as a result of the injections, Alan developed breasts or gynecomastia. He became impotent and suffered some depression and anxiety, understandably so, and kind of went into the last few years of his life in somewhat of mystery. Yeah. So we don't know a lot <laughs> about the time between the conviction and uh, Alan's death, which is its own mystery, which we'll talk about later. Um, we know he returned to work at Manchester University, and he continued his interest. He actually developed a new one after the war in morphogenesis, essentially the way that embryos develop. Mathematical biology! Yep, because yep. <laughs> it's Turing and everything is math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And suddenly, without warning, on the morning of June 8th, 1954, Alan was found dead in his apartment at the age of 41 by his housekeeper, Mrs. Clayton. The cause of death was ruled and seems to be, on first glance, a uh, suicide um, from ingesting an apple dipped in cyanide. And that is the long, sordid story of Alan Turing's life. Yeah, um, I think it, it's also important to say that after the trial, he was barred from like traveling outside of Europe because of his probation, but he did take the opportunity to kind of travel around Europe a little bit, and he, he went to Norway and met someone there, and he had done some other things. He also had like a, like a readership at some point, but there's really not a huge amount that we know from his, his last few years. He was... Isolated mostly by his own choice, but also because everyone now knew he was gay and they couldn't really be seen with him a lot. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, persona non grata. So that is the life in brief of Alan Turing. So let's move on to our why do we think they're gay section. We've already said like, hey, he's gay. So uh, <laughs> There you go. That's it. All right. End of episode, everyone. Um, <laughs> All right. So up. we're going to we're going to talk about, um, you know, it's, it's a fact. It's not speculation that he was gay. So we're going to talk about some of his significant relationships as well as um, some of his own thoughts around his sexuality in his later years. But just to reiterate some of the context of queerness around the time. Uh, so homosexuality was still illegal in the UK under the Labouchere section of the criminal law amendment from 1885, which outlawed gross indecency between men and was generally used to prosecute queer men where actual instances of sodomy were, weren't were able to be proven. So let's uh, jump into, let's go back to our friend Christopher Morcom, who we and others describe as Alan Turing's first love. You want to talk about uh, yeah, Chris I'll, I'll a little take, bit, Yeah, I'll Marin? take Chris. Um, so even, you know, as, as many a young queer will attest, we sort of start seeing the first signs of it in high school. Turing was no different in this one instance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he found himself romantically and sexually attracted to the other boys at his school at Sherburne early on. But as we said earlier, it really all came down to Chris Morcom. He first noticed and met Morcom, who was a year ahead of Alan, early in 1927. And they struck a friendship like striking a match. They shared an interest in science and math. By 1929, they were practically inseparable, and Alan was taking all of his classes with Christopher, which, mind you, means he was taking classes a year ahead of a year ahead of his, yeah, himself. Exactly. <laughs> um, they would write back and forth about science experiments, pass notes in class. They did chemistry together. They even went stargazing. They would compare star sightings through letters, which is like the most romantic thing ever, and I love it. Um, oh. By all accounts, he was Alan's first love, even if. Maybe they never said it out loud. Yeah, yeah. Ellen, Ellen never told Chris his his feelings. Um, they has been the, their their interest in science was one of the greatest bonds that they shared. Christopher introduced Alan to astronomy and to calculus. Uh, they had spirited discussions, even though they didn't always agree. Which Alan actually said made things much more interesting. He even wrote that he worshipped the ground Christopher walked on, and said that quote It was my ambition to do as well as Chris. And he also self-awarely noted that Christopher's work was always better than mine, because I think he was very thorough. He was one of the first people in Alan's life that actually took both science and Alan seriously, and Alan respected the hell out of him for it. Chris was 
everything Alan loved about himself, but he also worked within the systems around them. He would communicate kindly and clearly, as opposed to Alan's awkward fumbling around social expectations. He was organized in his work. Uh, he was very thorough. He would always show his work, which Alan was not prone to doing. <laughs> um, they went to Cambridge together to take a scholarship test, and the week of prep, which they actually did on Cambridge's campus, Alan described as the best week of his life. He hoped that he and Christopher would both receive scholarships to the same school, Trinity, and be able to go to university together. But while Chris won that scholarship, Alan didn't. And Alan wrote that to fail at the scholarship would mean to lose Christopher for more than a year, which he did. And yeah. then... Uh, yeah. So... Tragically, one of the one of the reasons why Alan never got to tell Christopher the way that he actually felt was because Chris died very suddenly only three years after the two had met on February 13th, 1930 of bovine tuberculosis. Uh, he had been sick for quite some time. He had contracted it from some infected milk that he had drunk years before. And Alan didn't even know that he had been sick. They had recently gone to a concert together, after which Alan had told himself, this isn't the last time I'll see Morecambe. Oh. Alan was absolutely heartbroken and devastated at Chris's sudden death, and his grief spurred him fully into continuing his work. On February 16th, a few days after Chris's death, Alan wrote to his own mother about his grief, writing, I feel sure that I shall meet Morecambe again somewhere, and that there will be some work for us to do together as I believe there was for us to do here. Now that I am left to do it alone, I must not let him down, but put as much energy into it, if not as much interest, as if he were still here. If I succeed, I shall be more fit to enjoy his company than I am now. Ugh. So he still, he, you know, he thinks, like, at some point they're going to be reunited. Uh, later in this same letter, Alan really drives home just how extremely special Christopher was to him, writing, It never seems to have occurred to me to try and make any other friends besides Morecambe. He made everyone seem so ordinary. He also wrote a really heartbreaking letter to Christopher's mother after his death, writing, Dear Mrs. Morecambe, I want to say how sorry I am about Chris. My most vivid recollections of him are almost entirely of the kind things he said to me sometimes. Of course, I simply worship the ground he trod on, a thing which I did not make much attempt to disguise, I'm sorry to say. I should be grateful if you could find me sometime a little snapshot of Chris to remind me of his example and of his efforts to make me careful and neat. I shall miss his face and the way he used to smile at me sideways. Oh, oh my heart. I heard us break it. I am regretting oh. re insisting on this letter's inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. After after Chris's death, Alan stayed in close contact with his family, and the Morecams even invited Alan to holiday with them in Chris's place, purely on the merit of the letters that he was sending the family that really showed the love there. It, it seemed that there was a clear understanding if subtextual, that there was a love between the boys, more so than any regular friendship. Uh, on the second anniversary of Chris's death, Mrs. Morecambe actually sent Alan all of the letters that Chris and he had sent to one another, which he had actually given to her in 1931 to say, hey, here's some of your, your son's writings. And she actually copied them out, and she actually sent a card to Alan inviting him to dinner at Cambridge when she came to visit. And so he arranged like for her stay and everything. The Morecams would go on to create a prize for scientific experiments, exhibiting originality in Chris's memory, and Alan actually won that prize. The legacy of Christopher Morecambe's relationship with Alan is that Turing's work out of Sherburne School, his interest in artificial intelligence and making sense of the mind, and the creation of the universal machine and solving a mathematical problem was representative of him dealing with his grief and personal loss. And with that... Uh, we move on a little bit to college. slightly less heartbreaking fair. <laughs> slightly less heartbreaking, although heartbreaking in the fact that he never quite never quite found somebody like yeah. Christopher Morkin again. So after Sherburn, you don't get as much detail about Alan's love life in specific detail as we did regarding the impact and nature of his relationship with Christopher. But at Cambridge and Bletchley and onward, he was never quiet about his sexuality and orientation. He basically just never stopped telling people he was gay. <laughs> he was like, if he was alive today, he would be one of the gays who's just like, I'm gay. Every conversation. <laughs> it was 
like a litmus test for friendship with him. He would just casually, in a conversation, drop a remark about a cute boy that he had seen or, or show you a picture or, or something like that. And if you were still chill with him, he would be open and charming with you. Otherwise, he would become closed off because Turing could compartmentalize like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. He could compartmentalize uh, with the best of them. He uh, met two people at Cambridge. One of them was an individual by the name of Neville Johnson, who was a third year mathematics student with Alan at Cambridge. They became lovers and began their friendship after Neville <laughs> joined Alan and his friends to play poker. They went on a trip together in Switzerland in the summer of 1948, uh, where they went uh, biking and mountaineering. Just good old Swiss gay boy fun. Yeah, what else do you do in the mountains of Switzerland? Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also met uh, <laughs> Kenneth Harrison, who was another King scholar, and Alan also fell in love with him. And this is someone who Alan actually told his feelings to. In the in Alan Turing the Enigma, Hodgins uh, writes, uh, he fell in love again, this time with Kenneth Harrison, who was another King scholar of his year studying the natural sciences tripos. Alan talked to him a good deal about Christopher, and it became clear that Kenneth, who also had fair hair and blue eyes, and who was and who also was a scientist, had become a sort of reincarnation of his first great flame. One difference, however, was that Alan did speak up for his own feelings, as he would never would have dared with Christopher. They did not meet with reciprocation, but Kenneth admired the straightforwardness of his approach and did not let it stop them from talking about science. I just really love that he's trying to, like, rekindle <laughs> what he had with Chris, with Kenneth. Like, ah, yes, here's another blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy who likes science. Let's see if we can make it work again. <laughs> Yeah. Um, he also had a friend at Cambridge named James Atkins, who we really couldn't find a whole lot about, mostly just that he had had a sexual friendship with him. And then we move on to Bletchley Park and Joan Clark. Alan struck up a friendship with Joan, who was the only woman cryptanalyst and mathematician in Hut 8. And I just want to talk a little bit about her for a minute, because she's pretty awesome. She started out in the clerical department, but would rise to the ranks of deputy head of Hut 8 and would actually be its longest serving member. And because of shitty sexism, at the time, she wasn't even allowed to be called a cryptanalyst. Women were only given the title and classification of linguist, even if they were doing the exact same work as the guys. Because patriarchy. She was actually, she was known to say, this is why I wanted to include this, she was known to say that she took great pleasure in filling out forms with the line, grade, linguist. Languages, none. Power move. <laughs> yeah, that's a power move if I ever saw one. Uh, so they met and began their friendship in spring 1941, and they became closer. They would often coordinate their days off to be able to spend time together. Later in 1941, Alan actually proposed to Joan, and you can actually watch an interview with Joan Clark, who was later Joan Murray, uh, talking about their engagement. We'll link it, the video in the show notes. But apparently, Alan's proposal was pretty low-key and awkward, very much in line with him, uh, where he basically just sat next to her and said, Joan, would you consider marrying me? She also noted that they didn't have much physical contact in the relationship. She accepted, but a few days after their engagement, Alan told Joan that he was gay, and though Joan was unsurprised and, quote, unfazed, he broke it off shortly and decided that he couldn't go through with the marriage. As Joan spoke in the interview that we'll link to, she said, quote, the next day we went for a bit of a walk together. He told me that he had this homosexual tendency, and naturally that worried me a bit, because I did know that that was something which was almost certainly permanent, but we carried on. So, uh, they would continue to be friends and colleagues for uh, a long time. And then finally, we reach Arnold Murray. The guy who pretty much made Turing fall. Yeah. Uh, more ways than one. Uh, don't, like, uh, don't like Arnold Murray very much. Uh, as we mentioned above, in uh, December of 1951, Alan had met and begun a brief relationship and we say relationship, we really mean a few trysts with Arnold Murray, who was working on the docks and most likely also dabbling in some sex work. They met when Alan was walking the streets of Manchester. Alan invited him to lunch. And as biographer Andrew Hodges, Andrew Hodges describes him, this might sound familiar. Fair and with blue eyes, undernourished, with his thin hair already receding, desperate for better things and more receptive than so many educated people, Arnold touched Alan's soft spot for lost lambs, as well as other chords. Is that fair with blue eyes again? Turing's got a type. <laughs> he really does. No wonder he found so many people in Norway. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> the, the two agreed to meet again and got together in uh, January of 1952, where Arnold visited Alan's home and a few days later spent the night with Alan. The next day, Turing noticed money missing from his wallet and later that week uh, accused Arnold of stealing the money. The next week, on January 23rd, Alan came to his house having been uh, came home to his house uh, having been burgled, and on February 2nd, after having a few drinks together with Arnold at Alan's house, Arnold admitted that his friend was responsible. The next morn, Alan reported the burglary to the police, and when the police officers began to investigate and ask about Alan's relationship with Arnold, Alan, f- feeling he had nothing to fear or hide, wrote a full five-page statement giving the full details of what had happened between the two of them. Partially because he was convinced that Parliament was close to legalizing homosexuality and so threw caution to the wind, and partially because he's Alan Turing and he's just going to write out what he did. Um, he was arrested and charged, and I guess we're going Vonnegut here, so it goes. <laughs> <laughs> always always an opportunity to go Vonnegut. Um, so I thought this was interesting. So we had mentioned above that Alan had written in a letter to his friend Norman that he'd one day t- write a short story telling him about what had happened between him and Arnold Murray. Uh, during Alan's time after the trial, in addition to his continued work to morphogenesis, he did actually turn to writing some fiction. He actually ended up penning that short story that was a very thinly disguised autobiographical short story. And it's what we can see now clearly as a way for Alan to reconcile what had happened to him. The central character was named Alec Price, an eccentric at Manchester University, hmm, Mm. a scientist, hmm, who was an expert in interplanetary travel and made a discovery that was essentially a proxy for Turing's machine. It was called Price's Buoy. And in the story, uh, Alan wrote, uh, this is a quote from, from the short story, Alec always felt a glow of pride when this phrase was used. Price's buoy. The rather obvious double entendre rather pleased him, too. He always liked to parade his homosexuality, and in suitable company, Alex would pretend that the word was spelt without the U. So, Price's boy. Price's boy. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Upon celebrating the discovery of basically what is the Turing machine, uh, Alec Price celebrates with a character named Ronald, which is, hmm, mysteriously an anagram of Arnold. Ronald is an out-of-work youth who kept company with criminals and did sex work. And this story was only a few pages long and unfinished, but it it showed an immensely personal glimpse into Alan's thoughts and experience around the whole Arnold Murray affair and also the way that he would probably have really liked to live his life parading his homosexuality. Such a great phrase. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's delightful. Uh, you know, gays and parades. Something, something. Uh, in August 2015, there were actually three previously unpublished letters from Turing that were released that reveal more about his own feelings regarding his orientation after the trial and his sentencing to chemical castration. In these letters from the 50s, he confides to a friend, Nick Furbank, I have had a dream indicating rather clearly that I am on the way to being hetero, though I don't accept it with much enthusiasm, either awake or in the dreams. Which breaks my heart. But then he goes on to say, Mother has been staying here, and we seem to be getting on a good deal better. I have been subjecting her to a good deal of sexual enlightenment, and she seems to have stood up to it very well. There was a rather absurd dream I had the other night in which I asked Mother's opinion about going to bed with some men, and she said, Oh, very well, but don't go walking about the place naked like you did before. Truly (laughs) the best ally. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Which, I mean, Alan's relationship with his mother, his mother had some interesting ideas around his sexuality and kind of really just kind of pushed, kind of pushed it off. Um, In these letters, he also wrote about a planned vacation in Corfu, where he said, I expect to lie in the sun, talk French and modern Greek, and make love, though the sex and nationality has yet to be decided. In fact, it is quite possible that this item will be altogether omitted. I want a permanent relationship, and I might feel inclined to reject anything which of its nature could not be permanent. So I thought that was important and interesting to include, because we, up until these letters were revealed and discovered, there really wasn't a lot of thought from Alan in his later years on exactly what he thought about his own queerness. Uh, So we're going to go into some kind of like 
main takeaways and final thoughts and some some other ideas and thoughts that we have around Alan Turing. We're going to talk about his death, going to talk about some potential neurodivergence, but I wanted us to kind of have a little mini conversation about what we think about some of the elements of his queerness. Uh, Marin, you had written a really interesting thing in the outline about like HRT, hormone replacement therapy, and the the idea of it like from being a tool of chemical castration to what is a valuable resource for trans people now. And I wanted to chat with you a little bit about that. Yeah. So when I was I was listening to um, Hodge's biography for thirty hours, uh, <laughs> it's a very it really long is, book. It's very long. <laughs> Um, I got to that section, and whenever I had encountered a discussion of Turing's punishment, it was just called chemical castration and kind of passed by. And there was no description of what actually the chemical castration process was. Um, Hodges describes it, and it's, uh, it, it's an implantation, essentially, of estrogen in his thigh. Um, which is not how we do HRT today, but back in that time, there was um, the prevailing thought that these hormones, they had kind of just been discovered, they could be used to, to regulate or change people. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, they do cause changes, just not the changes they wanted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it really goes to show, like, it's interesting, you know, this is what happens when you force someone to uh, be in a body that does not align with their own gender identity. Like, hormone therapy in a cis person is a punishment and is an abusive and violent thing that made Alan profoundly uncomfortable in his own body and his own, uh, you know, his own kind of sexual orientation and comfort. Um, And I think it just... Like, it's another thing that the queer community has seen used for, for bad, for, for mm-hmm. evil, and we've taken yeah. it for ourselves. We've said, well, if this is something that makes, honestly, makes cis people feel our pain, maybe we can use it to alleviate our pain if we're trans. Mm-hmm. And it works for some people. Yeah. So I thought I thought that was just something that I really wanted us to to kind of think about and I encourage folks to to read more about it. So we're going to we're going to kind of go into our closing here. Wanted to talk a little bit about Alan's death and the question of whether it was suicide or accidental, which is a large question. So like Marin had mentioned before, the official declaration from the coroner's report was that Alan had committed suicide, and for most part, this is the story that is widely accepted by biographers and colleagues and friends of Alan alike, but there's some speculation to the contrary. Biographers such as Andrew Hodges and David Leavitt subscribe to the suicide theory and have basically speculated that Alan was reenacting a scene from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which is one of his favorite films and fairy tales. So in Leavitt's words, he took, quote, an especially keen pleasure in the scene where the Wicked Queen immerses her apple in the poisonous brew. But that's not the only opinion. There is uh, philosophy professor uh, Jack Copeland posits that it's possible Alan's death was accidental. He cites a a few pieces of evidence. Uh, One, eating an apple before bed was Turing's ritual. He just did that every night. And the half-eaten apple was discovered by his bed upon his death. So it was assumed that was how the fatal dose of cyanide came to pass, but the apple was never actually tested for cyanide. Copeland also suggests that it's possible this was the result of accidental inhalation from cyanide fumes. He had been working on a project in the spare room of his home with an apparatus that uh, was set up and used, used to electroplate gold onto spoons, and cyanide was used to dissolve the gold. Copeland, who is a philosophy professor and not a coroner, <laughs> um, investigated the autopsy findings and suggests that the findings are more consistent with inhalation than ingestion. To further go along with an accidental death theory, uh, folks in Allen's life said that even though his career was destroyed and the hormone treatments took a, a profound toll on him, he endured such, quote, with good humor and wasn't depressed at the time of his death. His working papers were left in a mess. He made a list of to-dos once he came Came back from an office holiday, and there were purchases, including theater tickets, in his home. So, what do you all make of it? What do you think? Uh, there's a, a third 
theory that suggests that uh, that Alan did in fact commit suicide, but he specifically arranged for the delivery of the electronic equipment as a way specifically to dissuade his mother from believing he committed suicide and instead have her believe that he had died due to carelessness with his lab experiments. Um, Which she did, for the record. Yeah, she, <laughs> she did. was insistent that's... that he did not kill himself. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, you know, whether or not that's, we can never know. As as Copeland puts it, the exact circumstances of Turing's death may always remain unclear. But we can kind of look at the ways that he was living and was thinking and kind of make your own your own ideas around it. It's, uh, it's a mystery, and it's not one that we're going to see solved. No. So with that, let's move on to our next little closing point here, which, Marin, I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. Yeah. So neither of us are psychiatrists, and we generally on this show try to avoid armchair diagnosis. It's not really good to do, (laughs) especially if people themselves aren't neurodivergent. But But lo and behold! (laughs) (laughs) Some things continued to come up in our analysis of Turing, And fun facts. (laughs) I am autistic, so it's not nearly as bad. (laughs) Um, You're just recognizing some patterns in yourself and another human. Yep. Uh, So I'm here to sort of talk about uh, maybe Turing was autistic. Uh, So first, some disclaimers. Uh, Number one, we're not actually suggesting that we know. Two, we're not suggesting that there's any connection between his potential autism and his sexuality. These are individual and separate aspects of him, and he suffered for both of them. It is pretty popular, especially uh, in the last decade or so, to try and diagnose famous thinkers with autism. Because all you really need is a reputation for eccentricity, a pioneering mind, and some charming anecdotes about that one time they didn't seem to get people. But in Turing's case, we have the benefit of large, large amounts of evidence, since his particular eccentricities were the persistent subject of discussion by those who knew them, knew him. In 2003, before the most recent Diagnostical Statistical Manual characterized all forms of autism under just autism spectrum disorder, a paper written by Henry O'Connell and Michael Fitzgerald appeared in the Irish Journal of Psychological Medicine, considering whether Turing had Asperger's syndrome which is actually the same form of autism I was diagnosed with as a child. Asperger's has six diagnostic criteria, and the paper concludes that Turing had all six present. These criteria are, one, severe impairment in social interaction, see all of what we've talked about today, Uh, (laughs) two, all-absorbing narrow interest, also, (laughs) Uh, three, imposition of routine and interest on self and others, we didn't cover this all a whole lot, but there's a few, uh, he had a lot of rituals um, towards the end of his life. Every week he had a specific day, a specific night where he would go to use the Manchester machine. He had the Apple ritual. When he was playing games as a child, he would call out the adults near him for cheating in such a way that made it more likely for him to win. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, number four, nonverbal communication problems. Number five, speech and language problems. Um, but number six, and the one that I want to focus on, is motor clumsiness. Uh, if you paid much attention to a biographical segment, you'll already note that all of these uh, seem pretty relevant. But number six is something that I want to focus on because it's something that I personally have a lot of uh, interaction with. Um, Turing's handwriting was something that even he made jokes about. It was terrible. If you check the show notes, you will be able to see some photocopies of some of the letters he wrote. He faced so many issues at school for his handwriting. I tried so hard to actually transcribe the full letters and instead was only able to get quotes because I could not read half of his handwriting. Yeah, it's the worst. (laughs) And this is when he's trying to write well so other people can read what he's writing. Mm-hmm. Right? This isn't Turing scribbling a note. This is Turing like, I am writing a letter to communicate with my fellow human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking as someone who experiences what we now call fine motor delay, this is actually very similar to my experience. I was personally quite lucky that A, my parents decided to actually get me diagnosed, and B, my school was willing to accommodate my disability, even if it required invoking the Americans with Disabilities Act. In a parallel to to Turing's life here, he would often get, um, in fact, on one major exam, he actually got a failed grade due to just sheer illegibility. Um, And at one point, I got a a short answer quiz back, and it was marked half off, which is American for uh, zero. (laughs) (laughs) And the only note was, I can't read this. I basically had to lecture my teacher on 
disability discrimination and only by virtue of my existing disability agreement under federal law was I able to get that grade reversed. Turing did not have that luxury. Yeah. As I was listening to the Enigma, uh, I kept thinking, wow, that sounds like how I was growing up, or wow, that experience is really familiar. Uh, even though Turing was way, way smarter than me, don't get me wrong, and we're also separated in time by nearly a century. At a certain point, though, it just feels unfair not to bring up the similarities in the experience, at least anecdotally. Um, he suffered educationally for his disability, and the majority of commentary leaning towards him being exceptional at anything he cared about, held back only by his poor writing and single-minded focus. That's something that resonates with me as someone who's heard almost the exact same things half a century later. If you suffered professionally, especially in academia, making connections is as important as the actual value of your work, if not more so, especially in 20th century Europe, <laughs> um, which was still struggling to find a way to balance class structures with an increasingly stark and classless world. Though he did find success in courting the great minds of his field, which helped. He was not really well known outside his circles, though. Still, it takes a special person to be friends with John von Neumann, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a lot of what I was reading. I think we started this kind of conversation when we were, we were getting together talking about our research and our outline, and I came at it from a, like, wow, a lot of these things sound really familiar from an ADD perspective, and, and you were coming at it from an autism perspective, and I think it's just, like Marin said, we can't armchair diagnose, but if you are someone who is on one of these, uh, spectrums and experiences this, this style of neurodivergence, if you find comfort and resonance in Turing's story, claim it and embrace it and know that he was one of the most important people in the history of the modern world, which leads us to... Arguably the architect of the modern world. <laughs> literally. Um, which leads us to to his legacy and his impact. Um, it can be seen all around us in a world that is completely dependent on computing technology. We all have computers in our hands all We're the time. We're recording this using them. <laughs> recording this using them. People have computers in their bodies, which is a nice little meta thing. Um, in August... 2009, a British programmer named John Graham Cumming actually started a petition demanding the British government apologize for the prosecution of Alan Turing, and it received more than 30,000 signatures. The Prime Minister at the time, Gordon Brown, actually released a statement the next month apologizing on behalf of the government, writing... Thousands of people have come together to demand justice for Alan Turing and recognition of the appalling way he was treated. While Turing was dealt with under the law of the time, and we can't put the clock back, his treatment was, of course, utterly unfair, and I am pleased to have the chance to say how deeply sorry I and we all are for what happened to him. So on behalf of the British government and all those who live freely thanks to Alan's work, I am very proud to say, we're sorry, you deserved so much better. But, you know... An apology ain't shit. Um, not at all. Not at all. So in December 2001, William Jones and John Leach created another petition requesting an official pardon from the government. And even though it garnered over 37,000 signatures, the response from the Justice Minister, Lord McNally, was bullshit, replying... A posthumous pardon was not considered appropriate as Alan Turing was properly convicted of what at the time was a criminal offense. He would have known that his offense was against the law and that he would be prosecuted. It is tragic that Alan Turing was convicted of an offense that now seems both cruel and absurd, particularly poignant given his outstanding contribution to the war effort. However, the law at the time required a prosecution and, as such, long-standing policy has been to accept that such convictions took place and rather than trying to alter the historical context and to put right what cannot be put right, ensure instead that we never again return to those times. Fuck you. Fuck that. Ugh. So, so John Leach continued to fight, however, and he submitted several parliament bills and campaigned for years to secure a pardon until a bill was passed. Y you wanted to have, even though we can't bring Turing back and we can't make what happened to him not happen, we can officially say this was bullshit and have an official pardon, not just an uh, apology, but, a, but an actual like retraction of this should not have been a law that he was convicted under at the time. So... Eventually, Turing was pardoned, and Leach is known as the architect of the pardon and subsequently the Alan Turing Law, which is actually a really important part of this, which went on to grant posthumous pardons for nearly 50,000 other men who were historically convicted of gross indecency. 
And then on Christmas Eve 2013, Queen Elizabeth II signed an official royal pardon for Turing's conviction, which was only the fourth royal pardon granted since the end of World War II. So that's where we land. The significance of Alan Turing and his work. There's been lots of talk about, you know, whether or not it was right or wrong to pardon Alan in order in order to just like single him out for his his genius and um i think at the at the back of the the imitation game graphic novel the author writes that alan turing would have probably looked at that part and gone thank you very much now what about everyone else and, and so it's with- it's just so great that we have that everyone else here you yeah 50,000 exactly. people which is a lot of people to convict of being gay <laughs> have been pardoned <laughs> uh so with that uh we are we are running short on time but um just wanted to mention a couple of tie-in things i mean we've really we've really just mentioned them we suggest checking out sort of and making your own conclusions about the uh 2014 imitation game film and i personally recommend uh reading the imitation game alan turing decoded which is a 2016 graphic novel by jim ottaviani and uh leland purvis who's the illustrator it is mostly accurate and biographical but it does take some liberties but it, it's a really wonderful read if you want to get invested in the character of alan turing and kind of see you know where they teased out some some of the things it's mainly like told from the perspective of people in his life and so with that uh Marin, because you are our lovely guest I'm going to uh, haze you and have you do this first. Uh, it is time for our How Gay Were They ratings. So, Marin, knowing everything that you know about Alan Turing, how gay were they? So I would rate Alan Turing a, a 2 out of 2, which is anyone who knows anything about binary, yeah, that's 10 <laughs> out of 10. I love you so much. <laughs> that's so delightful. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rate Alan Turing, um, one fastidiously taking care of mug that says prof, uh, shape <laughs> to a radiator because you're so paranoid that someone will take your favorite dang mug. Um, Alan Turing never shied away from who he was and ultimately he was, uh, scapegoated and punished for it, but we thank him and I'm endlessly grateful to him and his work and the way he lived his life and paving the way for queer nerdy kids like us. So, um, is there, is there anything else you want to add, Marin, before we say goodbye? Uh, Turing was a boss who did not deserve what he got. (laughs) No, no, not at all. Uh, so let's, let's move forward in the future and not do shit like that anymore. Yay! Please! Yeah. Stare sidelong at current government. Uh, um, so it is, it is time to come to a close. Thank you so much, Marin, for coming on here and doing this. I'm really glad that we got the opportunity to finally do an episode together. More will, will most likely happen because you are a delight and you have a lot of wonderful things to say. It was my pleasure. Believe <laughs> me. <laughs> So why don't you tell our lovely listeners where they can find you and what you're talking about and doing on the internets. Yeah, uh, when I'm not telling the stories of real queer people, I'm usually working on uh, one or more uh, stories about fictional queer folks. Uh, You can find me uh, dropping long analysis threads on everything from episodes of this show uh, (laughs) to game design and my own writing over at at Rygar Borgvoss on Twitter. Um, I'm also working on, in the very early stages, an audio drama called Detectives Yay! Metonymous, which you can find on Twitter at at DetMetPod. That's D-E-T-M-E-T. And uh, if you want to support me financially, I'm just going to throw this in there. Um, yeah. The podcast also has a Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com slash DMPod. Yes, I'm very excited for it. It's it's going to be really, really cool. And as always, I am Lee, and when I'm not nerding out about old-timey queer folks, I'm usually talking about about comics and queer TV over at A Paradox in Flux on Twitter and, uh, you know, running the History is Gay socials, which, speaking of, uh, History is Gay podcast can be found on Tumblr at History is Gay podcast, Twitter at History is Gay pod, 
And you can always drop us a line with questions, suggestions, or just to say hi at historyisgaypodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the show and want to support us in continuing to make it, you can uh, become a member on Patreon. You can get access to Sappho Salon minisodes, sneak peeks. We did some live watches, which were really fun. Have your opportunity to have your voice show up on the show. Hey, Marin. Marin is a perfect example of that. Um, and more. Uh, you can become a patron by going to the support section on our website and join the ranks of our patron community along with the amazing Amanda Helton and Grace. Grace Giffoon. Thank you, everyone, for your support. We couldn't do this without you. I also wanted to mention that uh, right now, if you become a patron, our Patreon funds, other than what we need to uh, fund the actual creation of this show, the money that we are raising from Patreon is uh, going towards um, organizations like the Marsha P. Johnson Institute and the Okra Project um, and various bail funds for Black trans protesters right now. So please sign up for that, donate directly. <laughs> uh, but we really want to make sure that it's it's known that we are really wanting to send money out where money is needed right now. And also our, our proceeds from our store uh, will be going to that as well. You can click shop on our website. And also, like I mentioned before uh, in an episode, we have the History is Gay coloring book, which is coming along wonderfully. We have individual pages up for donation on our website, you can just go to shop and you can get images for a $2 donation to the Okra Project, which is a organization that provides free and homemade meals for black trans folks. And they're really wonderful and exciting. Very lastly, remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps more people find the show and we can expand our awesome community. And with that, uh, Marin, would you like to close out the show with me? All right. So that's it for History Absolutely. is Gay. Until next time. And stay curious. Stay queer. Stay queer.